Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining. I really am quite excited to talk about Nadia's book, World's Apart. Um, it's one of those books where you get sort of a great premise to learn what much of the 20th century was for the ordinary people in the Soviet Union and in Europe. It is a story about Nadia's great grandfather, Marcus, and his brother, Adolf. Uh, they were born in Poland and left as young men uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, Marcus went to the USSR, what was to become the USSR, he went to Russia, and his brother Adolf went to Switzerland. And really the stories and the stories of their families are shaped by the political events that happened throughout the 20th century in Europe and in the Soviet Union. Um, without giving sort of too much away, um, I will say that the families did lose contact for almost a century. And then almost a century later, Nadia uh, have made an effort to reunite the two families. And essentially this is what the book is telling us a story of. Nadia, it's an amazing premise. How, what did you know about this sort of secret unknown branch of your family in Switzerland as you were growing up? Did you talk about it? Like how did you find out that they even existed as a child? Hi everyone, thank you very much for being here. And yes, I, I suppose this is the this is where it all begins. This is where um, when I was growing up, I knew that there was a family in Switzerland. It was a big secret. My grandmother and my mother grew up and lived in the Soviet Union. So they kind of grew up with this trauma of not revealing too much about their family, not talking about where they came from. It was dangerous for many years. By the time I was growing up and asking questions in the 90s, it would have been fine to talk about it. By then it was fine but I think they were just so used to keeping it a secret and you know talking about it in the kitchen uh, only when no one could possibly overhear anything that there was they they were not very happy they didn't want to talk about it but also what I realize now having done all this research having reunited the families is, is they didn't actually know very much um, so since we're talking about the two brothers I am going to just straight away start by showing you a photo of the two of the two young men this is them uh, this is the last photo that they took together before they left Warsaw um, and uh, they stayed in touch. They were very close. Um, Marcus is on the right. Adolf is just a bit forward on the, uh, on the left. They were very close and they stayed in touch. They wrote letters to each other. Adolf left Warsaw 10 years before Marcus left and uh, went to Moscow. So there was like quite a big gap from when Mar uh, Adolf had children in uh, Switzerland first. And then by the time my grandmother was born in um, Moscow, her cousins in Geneva were already quite old enough to remember. And so my grandmother remembers getting uh, letters and postcards from her cousins when she was still a young girl. And she treasured those, you know, it was clearly for her that her father's, the two brothers were so close that for her father, his brother was very important. He talked about him a lot. So she kind of always knew, but given the circumstances, given the history and everything that she lived through in the thirties and then the second world war and especially post-war period, she got very used to not talking about them. So they were very very few facts you know she could she told me their names and the names of their husbands and she told me she always spoke with high admiration about her uncle Adolf and that's also something that we will get into a bit more later today because that also comes from the fact that you know in the eyes of my family uh, living in Russia for them their relatives in Switzerland were they were lucky you know they went the right way they had a much easier life that's how it was seen from the Soviet Union because just the pure fact that they were not in the Soviet Union was good already so you know so my grandmother always spoke with this admiration about her uncle Adolf and how lucky he was that he went to Switzerland and how lucky her cousins were to be living there she didn't know anything about their lives it was much later I discovered what they went through during the Second World War um, and the fact that Adolf had a watch factory which didn't which just seemed like a, a myth you know you couldn't even it was almost like it was made up for, for, for my family in the Soviet Union. So what prompted you to find out more and how did you do this? Um, well, I was, you know, when you're a teenager, a stubborn teenager, and you keep saying, being told, no, we don't know, the, you know, we can't tell you, I think I just wanted to know more. I was also really fascinated by my Jewish heritage. And again, because of everything I've just said about growing up in the Soviet Union and, and all the repressions and persecutions, 
my my parents knew very little about what it actually meant to be Jewish. And so when I started asking questions about, you know, why do I have, like, you know, with the surnames and who is Jewish and who isn't and, and Hanukkah and just anything that I could really like get my hands on. I wasn't give, being given any answers. And I think that those two things tied together, knowing that I had this Jewish family in Switzerland, knowing that we were Jewish because that wasn't being denied. I mean, that, that was a fact. And then wanting to find out more. And I think it took a long time. I was already living in London. I had been already living in London for a decade when we started looking. But I think by then it was a, it was a combination of facts. My uncle on the other side had just put together a family tree online and we saw how easy it was and how fascinating it was just to see the whole tree. And he did an amazing job with lots of photos and stories and anecdotes about everyone. So I think I just, I saw that and, uh, and from then we started looking on the same website. So in a sense, and it also comes back to what my grandmother did know and knew and didn't know. She also managed to remember the surname, the maiden name of Adolf's wife. And that's, you know, that's the kind of piece of information that not everyone would retain Why well, you know, and so, um, she because their Adolf and Marcus's surname was Neyman, which uh, Adolf later ch changed to Newman, and it is a very common surname. So when I started searching for Newman or Neyman on um, on that website, I wasn't getting anywhere. But it's only because my grandmother remembered uh, Adolf's wife's maiden name that's how we found the the Swiss branch. And um, so that that also goes back to what was their reaction when you reached out to them? It must have been quite something. Did you email them? So, did so I you... got in touch. How did I got in touch with Adol's granddaughter called Ariane, who is here with us. She's in the audience. I can see that she's there. Um, I got in touch, and it was a very emotional moment for me because I was with my mother, and we we sat there, and we knew that we couldn't just message them and say hi. We're like your lost, lo long lost family. We had to give them something that would make them believe that we were who we were. So I told Ariane the story of the, the, the father of the two brothers, Adolf and Marcus's father, Nachman, had left them. He went to America when they were still little boys and, um, and abandoned them effectively. I mean, he said he was coming back, he was going to settle and send for them and nothing was ever heard from him again. So I told her that story because I wanted her to know straight away that we were like the real thing. And um, she replied within 24 hours. And it was, I can still remember because I think especially, I, I lived a lot of that through my mother because, you know, I for me, you know, I, I grew up in the 90s. It was a completely different world. For her having grown up in the 60s and the 70s when, you know, going abroad or anything to do with outside the Soviet Union was the most, uh, incredible or the most exotic thing, having learned these names of these people and being told not to tell them, not to pronounce them outside the house. And I could see her face when suddenly, you know, it's Adol's granddaughter who is messaging us. And it's so simple. And it only took us an hour to find them. I mean, that was the astonishing thing that after decades and decades of no contact, of thinking that they were lost to us and we were lost to them, suddenly all it takes is maybe like 45 minutes to an hour of searching on this website and putting in the right names of finding your family. And uh, yeah, I think I, I lived that moment through her because for her it was just an absolutely surreal experience and um and we were really lucky um Adol's daughter Genya she was uh, still alive at the time she was 97 uh, she was on great form she knew exactly so Ari Ariane didn't actually know about us at all so that was kind of you know another uh, I suppose lucky moment that uh, Genya was still around and could tell um her daughter about us so when Ariane called her mother that night um, I mean, they were all shocked as well. They did not expect it. It came out of nowhere. Uh, but, you know, the stars aligned. Well, of course, uh, you described that moment when they first meet very, very powerfully in the book. And, of course, uh, I imagine it was the most emotional thing for your grandmother and her cousin, the daughters of the two brothers who uh, were born in Switzerland and in the Soviet Union. So maybe you could just give us a little reading of that moment when they meet for the first time. Yes, I'll read from that, um, from when we met for the first time. So that meeting took about six months to, to organize and get everything together, but uh, it was a very special day. So for those who do have a copy of the book, just in case you're interested, this is page 18. What year is it? Uh, just give us a bit of context, when did that happen? 2010, 2010, we met uh, just over 10 years ago. 
Uh, neither Anna nor Eugenia ever expected to meet in person. When they finally came face to face, they just looked at each other, searching for physical signs of resemblance, signs that would tell everyone that they were first cousins, almost sisters. Anna's miniature frame paled in comparison to her older cousin who had a more imposing presence. Together, they gave away a family trait that until then I had considered to be a beauty myth, an astonishing lack of wrinkles on their faces despite their age. As they sat together on the sofa, clasping hands and trying to find the right words for the occasion, it was the old German ballad that finally brought the tears and the sadness that both had felt since their meeting had become a possibility. They thought back to their childhoods and of the years gone by. They talked of what could have been had life not taken their fathers on such divergent paths, and they dreamt of having had a lifetime together. On the wall overlooking overlooking the living room, a portrait of Adolf hung in a beautiful frame of light brown oak, observing his daughter and his niece. He could not have foreseen that in the end, the two families would be reunited. And as you looked at his portrait, you could almost imagine his face breaking into a smile. Anna and Eugenia tried to make up for years of lost time. How do you get to know somebody you've known about your whole life, but have never met? Do you start with their marriage or their best years? Do you talk about the children and the grandchildren and share the little details about your current life? You could also talk about the Second World War, some of the worst years you have both experienced in the hope that sharing those moments might bring you closer. There is no right or wrong, no obvious solution. For Anna and Genya, as she's known in the family, there were whole decades to talk through. For a while, the conversation lingered in the air as the cousins were unable to take the plunge and settle on the most important, the most interesting, or the most urgent. Thank you, Nadia. Um, let, me, let me just show you straight well, away the, the photo from that first meeting since we're talking about it. Um, sorry, I'm just looking to the right to find it. There we go. So this is it. This is um, my grandmother on the left and Genya on the right. And um, Genya was 97, as I mentioned, when we first met and my grandmother was 86. So it really was quite miraculous that this this came together. And I think, um, I mean, everyone remembers it. It was only 10 years ago. It was an emotional day. Well, yeah, and the book in a very large sense is about their generation uh, because you follow their entire lives. Um, I found it really fascinating because obviously the events of the 20th century are really well known. Um, starting from the Second World War to Stalin's repressions to the general sort of life in the Soviet Union. And one could sort of arguably ask, well, what is there that's new that we could learn about any of that? So, and I have to say to my surprise, I have learned a lot of amazing new things because of the way that you told the stories, because these are the stories of real sort of ordinary, but really there's very little that's ordinary about those people, um, people who live sort of these great events. And when you look and zoom into sort of their lives and come sort of face to face with their struggles, with their happiness, with the horror of what they had to live through, you suddenly see the history come alive in a very, very different way. and it is actually a privilege. And then you suddenly realize because obviously your grandmother is still alive. And when you read about the 1920s and everything that's been happening in the Soviet Union, just how really recent that past is, you can almost touch it, you can almost smell it in your book. And I think that is what makes it so very, very, very special. But let us, without giving too much away, explain what actually happened. Why did the brothers go in two such different directions, one to Switzerland and one to Russia? Just give us a bit more context for, of yeah. that. Yeah, of course. So Adolf left in 1905. He married Marie um, and she already had a sister who was living in Switzerland and they were not in Geneva at the beginning. They were living in the Jura Mountains. Uh, in, a, in a small place, in a re relatively provincial place. And so Adolf, you know, they needed jobs, they needed stability. Warsaw at the time was not a stable place. Some things had gotten better for Jewish populations there. They were getting more rights and there was more they can do, but it wasn't stable. There were pogroms in the area. So they just needed jobs and stability. And I think it was a very difficult decision for Adolf to make because he was, he always wanted to get an education. He was studying at the University of Warsaw. So he wanted to continue his studies, but he knew that he had to choose stability. And so that's why they went to, to uh, Switzerland. 
and uh, Marcus stayed behind. I mean, we always in our family wondered why he didn't just follow them to Switzerland. But, you know, one brother's choice is not the others. You know, Adolf got married. He was starting a new life. So so they left. And Marcus also they had to, had to look after their elderly mother. Um, and it would be another over 10 years before Marcus went. We don't know have the exact date for when he left. We think it was after the First World War. He was um, he came to Moscow. He they were the two both brothers were quite political, into politics, they were both socialists. Um, I, our understanding in the family is that Marcus became a, a communist while he was in the army because that was quite a common experience. Uh, he would have been exposed to a completely different world and completely different layers of society while he was in, serving in the, in the Russian Imperial Army during the First World War. He would have met people he had never met. You remember, he came from, he was a boy from, a, from Jewish streets of Warsaw. He, is, he was, um, you know, he wasn't educated himself. He he wanted an education, but there was no money in the family for that. But he definitely read newspapers and was very much aware of what was happening in the world. But I think when he met different people that he he was used to knowing in the army and different ideas, and at the time, that's when uh, you know Bolshevik ideas were sweeping through the Russian population. So um, he became exposed to something completely different and he was an idealist and this is something my grandmother always highlighted. He was a very idealistic man and he believed that you know there needs to be more equality for the people. So when the war was over he went to Moscow and at some point you know when they, he arrived as Russia was going through a massive transformation it was becoming the Soviet Union and it was a very uh, very tough time very dangerous time very there was a lot of turbulence a lot of people died it was a very very difficult time but during that time he met his future wife um my great grandmother and um they made a life together and marcus joined he became a nepman nepman uh, is, is short for the new economic policy which was an economic initiative that was started by lenin and it was meant to kickstart the economy after the years of civil war that led to the creation of the soviet union because the economy was in shambles and they needed something so lenin created the new economic policy and the idea was i mean it, it it's quite drastic you know it was meant to uh they were basically creating businesses it was a very entrepreneurial idea of and it was very controversial among the more um, staunch Bolsheviks, those who would later become Stalinist, because because of that, because you know, the idea was not to create middle classes and entrepreneurs. The idea was to make everyone equal. But this was Lenin's vision, and so Marcus became one of the net men. He had his own stall at the market. He. Uh, you know, he wasn't a big trader or anything like that, but he was making enough money to support his family to get a nice flat. And I describe it very vividly in the book because my grandmother remembers those times. She was born um, while Lenin was still alive in 1923. And so she, when she was a small child, she remembers the big apartment that she they used to have that she shared with her parents. She also had step brothers and sisters um from her mother's first marriage so it was a very happy happy child for her unfortunately when stalin um took over and decided that the new economic policy and net men were the enemies of the people that's when it all went terribly wrong and um things started falling apart so in the 20s we could say that the brothers were both entrepreneurial one with the watch factory in Switzerland, another one in Russia, but um, quite soon, sort of in the early 30s, at least Marcus's dreams came crashing through. Tell us what happened uh, without, I don't know how much you want to tell, because obviously, you know, there is a book to be read. <laughs> there is a book to be read. Um, I mean, look, he was arrested. That's what happened to all the netmen. Some of them uh, got off lighter than others some of them were sent to the gulags i think i mean again they were netmen of different scales some of them were like like markers they were small scale uh, businessmen trading others had whole shops and staff that they employed and ran massive businesses so marcus got off relatively lightly i mean i don't want to diminish his experience whatsoever but he w did not get go to a gulag he got sent to a to nizhny novgorod um, which is relatively given Russia's uh, huge scale is not that far and he just he, he, he wasn't allowed to live in Moscow anymore so he got sent and he got a job he got an apartment he lived there but you know it was still like a, a dramatic and extremely traumatic as well event in the family because he had a small 
daughter, he had a new family, he would miss his daughter's childhood, he would come back eventually, but he would miss his daughter's childhood. And it also illustrated at the time there was a huge wave of these arrests. So suddenly everyone was on edge, you know, no one knew who was going to be next. And that kind of set the, the pace for many, many decades to come. Um, and then, of course, your uh, grandmother with her mother got kicked out of their apartment as part of the condensation policy. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, tell us so a little bit about he, that. He became a Lyshenitz. Lyshenitz is someone, it's from the word, you know, those of you who speak Russian, you're, you're deprived of everything. You're, you're disenfranchised from society. You, you have no uh, voting rights anymore. You lose everything. You're owned to, you know, to kind of atone for everything you'd kind of enriched yourself with during the years of being a netman and so they were stripped of everything they had as well so they had to leave the flat that they uh, they used to rent with everything that they they owned that was inside the flat had to be left behind the only two items that they were able to to salvage and bring with them was my grandmother's cot and um my great grandmother she begged a family friend who was helping them while they were going from one place to another to in a small apartment that she found not far she had this really tall mirror that had been inside a wardrobe and so she tore the uh, the mirror out of the wardrobe because that was her means to life she was um uh, she was a designer of clothes, of women's garments, and so she needed the mirror to be able to see how uh, how things were going to fit. So she she convinced him, and this was extremely dangerous, of course, but she he took the risk and he helped them, and they tore the window out, the mirror out of the wardrobe, and she took that with her. So they were those were the two items that she could salvage, and they moved to another uh, communal apartment, which was not very far, where they had two rooms for the four of them. But then uh, one, my grandmother's stepbrother moved out soon after he was much older. You describe uh, with great sort of precision the feeling of fear that your grandmother as a little girl lived with on a daily basis in the Soviet Union. And not necessarily a fear of being Jewish uh, or that alone, but just generally of the arrests that were happening, of the atmosphere of you know, people telling on each other, you were never safe anywhere. So, and to that degree, of course, uh, life in the Soviet Union could wouldn't be more different to what it was for your relatives in Switzerland. But by now we're sort of moving towards the late 30s. And of course, the Nazi ideology dominating uh, a lot of Europe. And of course, that hadn't escaped your family in Switzerland. Um, we here we won't give away uh, what happened. It is a very, very powerful part of the book. Uh, but what is again um, absolutely amazing is the simplicity and the kind of simple everyday detail with which you tell the story of what it was really like to live you know, through these events, not really knowing what they actually meant. Like say your family didn't move from one place to another in time and that had its consequences. And then when they did decide, decide to go on the move, this was again kind of, you know, you live in parallel with what is now known as the most horrific period of the 20th century, but you have no idea what is happening. And I wonder whether we could have a little bit like a page or so from that part of the book um, where all these events unfold right before our eyes and they don't even realize this is happening. Yes, let me just backtrack a little bit. So Anna yeah. had two daughters, Genya, who we met when she was 97 at the meeting and Ava and Ava was the eldest she was already 17 when my grandmother was born and so they were living in Geneva and uh, Ava married uh, a man who whom she followed to Antwerp he was of Russian Jewish stock as well but his family had moved to France first and then they they were diamond traders so they ended up in Antwerp so in the 1930s when hitler comes to power they are in belgium and everything you know is fine at the beginning but he is the only person in her family who is not in in his family who's not a diamond trader so he was working for a german silverware company and as soon as the nazi anti-jewish laws started uh, coming into effect he lost his job he was the first one almost in Antwerp or almost in Belgium to kind of suffer from the anti-jewish uh, persecution because he was working for a german company that had to fold uh, so if anything all the signs were there 
but you know I think it's really difficult for us um, almost 100 years later to kind of estimate what they were thinking what they were feeling they did not see it coming they were not worried they, they thought it was going to blow over um, so they were so that's that, that's one um, cousin they were in um, Antwerp Ava's sister Genya had married also a man of Russian Jewish roots who had settled in Palestine. She met him in Geneva where they were study, studying together. And then when they graduated, um, he wanted to go back to the Middle East and she followed him. And that wasn't a very popular decision. Adolf was not a Zionist in that sense. He did not believe that Jews need to go to Israel. He was, um, he was really against her going because he thought that he would get violent there and he would have preferred if she'd stayed in um, Geneva, but she uh, was a very determined young woman and so she followed her husband and they settled in Tel Aviv and this was in 1935, 36 when they left. Um, so complete, so, and, and this is also, you know, just giving you all these, um, you know, bits of story, but this is also what made me want to write the book is because when I, found my family you know it was the once the original the initial kind of moment of joy and happiness and emotion was over when I started discovering their stories this is what made it for me because I could see that there was one family that was broken apart and where people my relatives my ancestors had lived through so many different historic events in so many different parts of the world or parts of Europe, you know, there is Russia and Stalin and Lenin and all the post-Soviet, post-war stuff that comes. And then, you know, on the other hand, you have uh, Switzerland and the watchmaking industry, but also you have uh, Belgium being occupied by the Nazis and everything that they live through in during the Second World War there. And then you have Palestine, which is not yet Israel, which will then become Israel. And, you know, in that sense of just amazement that one family can have all that in have having lived through so many different events that was part of the reason why I thought that this would make a great book and the fact that you know we reunite a century later and we can tell this story in parallel uh, that was one of the reasons why I plunged into it uh, but coming back to um to Ava and her years um in Belgium so she she after they got married she lived in Belgium, but they came back to Geneva all the time. This was like very close, very easy on the train. And when uh, the war was about to begin or was already happening, but hadn't yet affected uh, them in uh, Switzerland or in Belgium, uh, I think this is where you, Dasha, if I, if I understood you correctly, this is where uh, I was going to read from another chapter. Um, she was actually, Ava was actually in um, Geneva uh, in 1939. She spent quite a good chunk of the early uh, 1939, quite a few months at the beginning of 1939 in Geneva, but her husband already out of a job, he was itchy, he wanted her to come back with their daughter, he wanted to reunite the family, and so she decides to go back and join him in Belgium. And this is um, on page uh, 112, that I will read a couple of um, paragraphs about that journey back and what will follow. Um, in early May, Ava packed her bags and told her parents that she would be back to visit again in a few months. Once her decision was made, she didn't linger. She didn't want anything to change her mind, to convince her that she was making a mistake. She packed a few of her belongings and with her first stole over her shoulders, despite the warming weather, she set off for the Cornavan station. Anita was by her side. As she waved goodbye to her grandparents, she looked forward to coming back to see them as soon as possible. On Monday the 6th of May, Ava and Anita left Geneva. They were heading to Paris where they would spend several hours before continuing their journey to Belgium. That day and for the next four, French and Belgian intelligence officers received a steadily increasing number of reports of intense German military activity immediately opposite the Luxembourg border, but they didn't react. On the 7th of May, Ava and Anita were in Paris. They walked the streets of the city and Ava took her daughter to some of the parks that she remembered from her visits as a child. As, as they walked past the newspaper kiosk, Ava glanced at the headlines, but they reassured her. Paris Soir wrote that the battle for Narvik was continuing despite the snowstorm. The war felt far away. On Wednesday the 8th of May, Stannis welcomed his wife and daughter to Brussels and he couldn't hide his happiness. He didn't know that the French and Dutch embassies in Berlin and Switzerland had already been informed by reliable sources of the coming attack. He didn't let Ava ask him for the latest news of the war. He announced to his wife and daughter that to celebrate their return they were going on holiday. 
In fact, he had rented a small apartment on the coast and they were going to stay there for three weeks. The rest of the day was spent planning the journey to the seaside. Stanis's brother Michel and his family would join them and Anita looked forward to playing with her cousins Silva and Izzy. Stanis's father Abraham, a disabled elderly gentleman in a wheelchair, was accompanying his family to escape the stuffiness of Antwerp. He was hoping to enjoy the sea air, thought to be beneficial for his health. On the morning of the 9th of May, they bought the necessary provisions for the trip. That Thursday evening, the family reached their destination, the Belgian seaside town of Depan. In 1940, the coastal town attracted visitors from all parts of the country. With white sandy beaches stretching as far as the eye could see, it was perfect for a family summer holiday. The dates float past me and I, and I feel like I'm in a bad dream. I'm trying to make them stop. I want to turn the clock backwards, make Ava and her family turn back. Having first left the safety of Geneva to travel to Brussels and then deciding to leave the Belgian capital and head for the coast, they would be caught up in one of the war's biggest and most defining moments. The name of Depan doesn't immediately bring up the horrors of the Second World War, since in British collective memory, it has been overshadowed by the events that unfolded in the town's southern neighbor, the French resort of Dunkirk, some 20 kilometers away. For the Zussman family, there was no time to enjoy the beauty of their surroundings. From the moment they arrived at their apartment on the evening of the 9th of May, they could see in the distance of them, menacingly approaching the coast, but then turning back and flying away. They returned again to the local population and the daymakers, but there was no way to find out what was happening. Stanis reassured his family that they were just German propaganda leaflets. In a few hours, those planes were dropping bombs. I, I, I mean, I'm still, sh I, sh I shake every time I read this bit. I, the, the only reason that these pages exist is because Ava had a diary. She wrote a diary for most of her life and she wrote the diary as she lived through the events, but she also wrote in hindsight. And I was privileged and lucky to, to be able to read those pages. And it is because of those pages that we know most of this story of what happened to her, because she's the only family member that I didn't get to meet. And so when I started researching, when I already knew that I was going to write a book and I started reading and researching, when I discovered this bit, I mean, there, there are so many different layers of sentiment. One, you know, the fact that it still shakes me when I read this is, is just how how much we know in hindsight and how much they you just, you know, you could just never know what's about to happen. The other thing is that, you know, and this comes back to write to the reason why I wanted to write the book is that this is history that I learned at school. This is history that I learned reading books at university or at any time. You know, this is not, I never felt when I was growing up in Russia that this is, was my history. When I read books about Stalinism or the, the Second World War as the Great War as it's known in Russia, you know, everything that happened afterwards, I feel there's a genetic and there's an emotional kind of understanding of what's happening. It's so ingrained and, you know, you kind of, you grow up with it. You hear about it from your parents and it's at school and it's all the poetry that you read when or you learn when you're at school. This, the history of Belgium and France and Switzerland, what happens on that side, it, it was, I never felt like it was my history and it was only after I met my Swiss family and I started talking to them, interviewing them, reading about that's when I felt, you know, a lot closer to it. It brought me to, to that side, it brought it closer to me as well, my understanding of history. Well, uh, and that is what is so particularly beautiful about it. Again, just going back to the earlier notion of all the personal vignettes and understanding how people's mentality was shaped. Because if we go back to the USSR, um, after the war was over, sort of a more peaceful life could begin for your relatives in Switzerland, but it couldn't be more different in the USSR where the culture of fear still prevailed. And in many ways, um, the time after the war was even more horrible because, you know, people wanted to believe that the post-war Soviet Union was going to be a brighter, happier place. But really it was not. And as we know from the story about your grandmother, and I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about her early career straight after the war and one of the biggest challenges that she had to face sort of as a Soviet citizen. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think you're very right. And that's one of the things that I definitely wanted to highlight in the book is that, you know, after the Second World War was over, things that did not get easier in, in Moscow, not for my family. Um, if anything, again, not to diminish anyone's experience, but the years of the war that my grandmother spent in evacuation, she was a student at university, you know, yes, it was, of course, very traumatic for her to leave her father, who had, uh, who was in Moscow by then behind and be evacuated. And the whole evacuation process was an incredibly uh, difficult affair but um you know in compare again and i've vowed not to ever compare anyone's experiences but they were not in my grandmother's life the years of the evacuation were not the, the, the hardest years i think um but after after she returned to moscow the she she had graduated by then she was a young woman she soon to be married she was working as a translator, she studied German, uh, like a lot of people at the time, because they were preparing military translators and all sorts of translators in German. She already spoke through what she learned at school. So she became a, an interpreter. And um, her first job, um, I, I do, I know we discussed that I was going to read another bit, but I am slightly conscious of the time, which it seems to be running away from us. So I think I'll skip the reading. I'll just say that this was, you know, she grew up with the fear and the paranoia and the repressions and everything, like mainly the fear, you know, but she had never maybe experienced it herself until her, she got her first job when she was working for um, as a, uh, an interpreter for, for a German uh, company in Moscow. And um, she was basically asked to spy by her, her employer on the Germans that she was translating for, and she refused. And I remember the first uh, time that my grandmother told me this story. And again, you know, as I mentioned, um, when I was growing up, it's not just the family that she didn't want to talk about. She generally just never wanted to talk about her life. And this was this fear that, you know, what happened happened and it's better to move on. And, and this is something I've come across a lot. Uh, talking to people who lived through trauma. I think this is a way of just moving on and, and dealing with their past. And so my grandmother only really opened up um, after we met our Swiss family, when she wanted uh, to pass her experience to me and to to the to, to next generation so that we know what she lived through. She opened up and she started talking. And this particular episode of, of when she was asked to spy for her employers, she only told me when I was interviewing her for the book. And um, she told me, she, she told me a couple of times, we went over it a couple of times, but she was very, very reserved with it she she as soon as she told me that she refused I was shocked because I didn't know such a thing was possible I you know maybe I was naive but um I it was my assumption that if you were told to do something if you were told to spy on your colleagues you didn't have a choice and you know my grandmother put her foot down and said I'm not doing that and her reasoning was that you know I spy on my colleagues first and then I'm going to be spying on my family next and once you're in it it's very difficult to stop but I think she was incredibly lucky as I describe in the book she maybe that's why she kind of put her foot down she knew that she might potentially have a way out but she was incredibly lucky and having come across this experience you know in her early 20s as she was by then I think that marked her for the rest of her life like she, the fear doesn't go away you know what is possible you know what might be asked of you and you you're just careful you don't you don't dare do anything wrong or what you what might be perceived as wrong you know that's why she never looked for her family in Switzerland because you know having family abroad was unthinkable um so I think yes yeah, she definitely learned the hard way well and that really does show in the book especially sort of going post-war where the Russian side of things is a lot more sort of fact-based and um with the Swiss side of the story full of emotion, full of love, full of drama. And you can almost see your grandmother thinking, okay, I'm gonna tell you the facts, but I'm not gonna tell you how I felt about them. And perhaps not even telling you all of the facts. And that actually just brings me to a wider question about the whole book. Um, obviously interviewing people, you get in subjective memories because memory by nature is always a subjective matter, especially when you're talking about childhood or about very traumatic events uh, you choose to remember things in the way that makes you more comfortable so how did you stay true to what you've learned uh, from the diaries uh, from interviewing your relatives and being historically accurate at the same time because there's got to be quite a challenge when writing a memoir like that 
Yeah, a challenge is, uh, is definitely the right word. Um, I mean, I, I started with the interviews. I got as many interviews done as I could and I carried on doing them for years. I noted everything down. I was writing drafts and drafts, but as I was writing different drafts of uh, different historic episodes, I was double checking, and this is where maybe my BBC kind of career, being a journalist, a BBC journalist comes in, you know, if it's not double sourced, it, it's not a fact. So I was double sourcing everything. I read books, I read articles, I consulted historians, I wrote, I, I read academic papers, but I needed to find a confirmation that it was possible. And, um, you know, because I, I just, as you say, memory is not, um, is not objective and just because you remember something happening doesn't mean it happened that way and uh, especially with both sides actually my grandmother as you said it was very factual but those she always repeated the same stories almost in the same words because I think that's how she kind of wanted to remember them that's how she preserved them on the Swiss side there was a lot of emotion and very often actually very little, a few facts and I had to kind of dig down and say okay but what year was this what was happening in the world around you at the time and and it was a very yeah it was difficult and uh, quite a challenging experience but I also had Ava's diaries which um actually confirmed a lot of what um, other Swiss family were telling me so that there were mentions of separate events that happened there at the time so that was incredibly useful but basically I just tried to take a step back and when I really couldn't um, couldn't find any confirmation of something happening I think um, I think there was actually very few of those instances, but I, I did change some things from what I was told to make sure they, they worked with the historical narrative. So I, I prioritized the history being correct and made sure that everything fit together. Yeah. Um, I just would like to say to everyone that at this point, we do welcome um, everyone's questions whether people want to ask them in person or just write them in the chat so um please do ask but while you're doing that um and getting your thoughts together Nadia, how long did it actually take you to research this book and write it like sort of from the moment you've decided until the moment it saw the light of day how well, long the process is that i don't know if it's a fair kind of it took seven years I don't think it's fair to kind of just put it out there you know it does come with caveats it took it's seven years of research and writing <laughs> and having two children in the middle and having a full-time job so you know it doesn't necessarily take seven years you know I did have to stop and start again but while we're which I, I realized that as always, I got distracted and didn't show, show you quite as many photos as I wanted to. So while we're waiting for a question, uh, this is a photo of my grandmother during the, just after the Second World War. This is around the time when she was working as an interpreter. Um, and this is a photo of um, Ava and her, her first, her husband Stanis. This is the man she followed to Antwerp. This is their engagement photo that was taken in Geneva. And her sister, Genya, and her husband, this is them. I must say, these are amazing, amazing pictures. Yes, we do have a message, maybe uh, this is a message not so much a question, but also sharing in experience. Maybe Nadia, would you like to? Shall I read it out? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Thank you, Asa. Thank you for your message. Thank you, Nadia, for the wonderful talk and for the book so inspiring. My current marathon research of exploring the silences in my family from the starting point of no stories, no documents, no photographs. I dug out the life stories of seven children of my great great grandfather Feitel Blumenfeld, a rabbi, educator and reformer. This sounds fascinating. Through excavated archival documents, letters, articles, memoirs, photographs and postcards similar to Nadia, I'm exploring the disappearances, ideologies, migration, silences, etc. Three branches. He now lives in London. Oh wow, this is this is amazing. Um, I hope I can still access this chat after this um, talk is over because I would love to read this properly. And um, oh no, you know, for me, genealogy is amazing. I love discovering family members and stories. Um, 
and piecing things together because there's so much. And as I was doing my research, I remember one of my trips to Geneva, I was staying with Ariane and um, I was looking for, I was particularly in interested in photographs on that trip. And she had an errand to run. So she said, look, here's a whole cupboard of photo albums. I need to go, I'll be back in an hour, help yourself. And I was looking for a lot of photos and it felt like it was never ending and I didn't know exactly what I was looking for. But then I took out one album, which turned out later it was Ava's um, album. And in it, that was a real treasure. So in this, I'm going to share it now, but in, in that album, I discovered photos of the family. And this was one of the photos that I didn't know existed. These are the two brothers. And this photo is from 1891. This is the end of the 19th century, the two brothers with their parents. And this was the first time I came across that photo. I had until then never seen a photo of Nachman and his wife, Hannah, the, uh, the mother of the two brothers. I had never seen, I had no idea what they looked like. And I came across that photo in, their fam in Ariane's family archive. And I think Ariane herself wasn't aware that she had that photo because she inherited lots of photos, uh, photo albums from her aunt Ava and um, they were just sitting there. And for me, you know, I always obviously knew that we, there was one family and Warsaw in Moscow, like we, we had pieced it together and there was enough evidence to confirm what we understood to be true, you know, that we were one family and Adolf and Marcus were, were the correct people that we had uh, connected. But this, but seeing this photo, that that's when it was, you know, really real. This is when it really hit home that this is them. This is 19th century. And to, to have this photo in the family archive is, it's a real privilege. It's so old. And I think we all treasure, treasure it. Well, actually, one of the questions fits very nicely into it. You mentioned earlier on how the two divided families searched uh, one another's faces for similarities. Now that you've known each other for several years, have you noticed any shared personality traits or talents or even likes and dislikes? Um, that's a really good one. I think I, from the very first meeting, I actually noticed because we always said in our family that women in our family didn't have any wrinkles. And that's certainly true for my grandmother, who's 97 now. And, um, you know, well, I mean, obviously she does have wrinkles, but I think um, this is her holding a copy of the book. But I think she not necessarily doesn't necessarily look 97. And when she was when we went to Geneva 10 years ago and met uh, the others, I noticed that as well, because I thought that Genya didn't look her age. Age. and um, I don't know for, for us that's like a beauty myth that runs in the family we just always say that oh, the women in our family don't don't get wrinkles um, maybe that's um, and that was one thing that we said but otherwise I don't know I think look it's really hard with families and you never know what you're going to what's going to happen I think we were incredibly lucky that when we found each other not only did we get on but we do actually feel like family you know we go to each other's birthdays well now everything's obviously up in the air but we travel a lot and we go back and forth between London and Geneva and it really does feel like we're family and that wasn't a given for for any reason you know just because you meet someone who happens to be related to you I don't think that you automatically connect with them but I think we were incredibly lucky to what language do you all speak to each other we speak French and English at the moment um so my grandmother and Genia spoke German to each other that was the only language they had in common my grandmother never learned English um and uh, Genia spoke German because she uh, was born in the German speaking part of Switzerland and in Switzerland um, most people tend to speak German so, but that was miraculous for that they had a language in common and um, but at the moment, yes, we speak French and, and, and English together, which is great. A question about uh, researching family trees. So has the increasing popularity of modern ancestry websites made the job of peace and loss family ties together easier? Yes, absolutely. And there is quite a few websites that dominate um and they i think some of them even work together now where you can find a match if you're on one website it, it helps you uh, match with the other i mean obviously there's dna testing as well which i haven't actually done yet but i keep thinking that we should and see what, <laughs> who else might be out there um and they also link up with some websites so absolutely it's so much easier uh, but also i see that there is a following question about family research in poland has become easier yeah. Uh, but it's still a lot harder than researching family trees in the UK, which, of course, makes sense. You know, in the UK, it's one, I mean, it's all the um, 
parish records that tend to be kind of preserved more or less but I think for me the main thing is that they're all in English and one of the biggest challenges I came across when researching um, family tree and Polish names and everything is that especially with Jewish families um, they spoke Yiddish and so depending on the time of when the records were made they were either made in Polish or in Russian or in Yiddish and so you almost have to speak all those three languages to be able to put things together so when we were looking for Adolf uh, Maurice his wife's uh, maiden name was Malach and we didn't know how to spell it and that was one of the reasons why it took us so long so tr to transliterate it back into English we had to try Malach with a KH or with an H or with a CH because we didn't know how they would have then spelt it in English living in Geneva where they transliterate from French and that's a completely different thing as well and it's the same with um, with Polish and Yiddish and Russian and all the records and, and then the spelling changes so much you know with common Jewish surnames that end on itch for example you know you can sometimes it can be it's if it's Polish or you know it can be ITH or ITC like it, it's just really really complicated and you kind of really need to 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 fight to analyze everything and you'll have one family with the surname spelt in different ways so it is very tricky but there are organizations and charities that are doing amazing work uh, digitizing all the records that have survived um, and I have been in touch with um, some of them and I went to there is a Jewish genealogical institute in Warsaw there's a tiny little room in the in one of the museums that they occupy but I spoke to them as well and they were very helpful and they actually helped me find the grave of uh, Hannah of um, Marcus and Adolf's mother in Warsaw as well. Well I will say that you're very lucky that your grandmother is alive to tell the story because I bet doing all of this research uh, for the Soviet Union era would have been an impossible task. Uh, I don't know how you found research in Russia and access to archives, but I can't imagine it being easy. It's not easy either. And I worked with a historian who helped me, who had all the access to all the right places and knew, knew where to look when I needed to find stuff. And it is through him that we found about Marcus's military career, because my grandmother didn't really know anything about his service in the First World War, because obviously, you know, he served in the Russian Imperial Army. Then he comes to Moscow and there's a different country and you kind of want to hide everything that's connected with the empire, you know, to, to kind of not have it uh, work against you later. But he was actually decorated by the Russian Imperial Army. He was created three times for bravery and we had no idea so that was a shock a complete shock when my grandmother learned about that but th that we found those records in the Russian archives and that was with the help of a historian I don't I, I mean I, I have no idea how we, it, it's very difficult in Russia yeah mm -hmm. uh, well another question connected to Russia and your grandmother uh, has she and the family considered leaving Russia before the 1990s sorry um, say that again did your family, your Russian family, ever consider leaving okay, Russia before the 1990s? Yeah. No, I don't think so, because my mother never wanted to leave. You know, she always said that she was happy where she was. She was a very positive person and she was very, you know, always very involved in her life and what was going on around her. And so she never considered leaving, I think. Her sister emigrated uh, when the, the June of, like one of the waves of emigration in the 90s, but she, my mother always wanted to stay. And I think for my grandmother, it wouldn't, it, it, she had a very interesting, interesting experience uh, being a German teacher after that uh, unpleasant encounter uh, with uh, when she was asked to spy she then got a new job and she taught uh, German for her whole life and as part of that she actually went to Dresden uh, during the Soviet times and in East Germany and that was a completely eye-opening experience but I think there was also a kind of an experience that was lost in translation a little bit because she didn't know what to expect and didn't realize I think that East Germany was a very different um, place to what she imagined Europe to be. And so she was shocked by the cues for everything and the lack of food. And she came back very disillusioned with uh, with Europe. I mean, I know it, it sounds very strange saying it now, but there was a definitely a lack of information available to her in those years. And so she was completely disillusioned and didn't really think about it anymore. You know, she'd been to, she'd been abroad, she'd seen it, and there were queues for food there and that was it. So she kind of just got on with it. And I think the combination of those things meant that they didn't think of leaving in the nineties. Um, another comment, which is great. Uh, it sounds like 
all these family stories that could be turned into this fantastic novel. Save this chat. I definitely need to save this chat. Yes, thank you, Asya. And then I can read it properly. And I can just can probably. Yeah, sorry. Go on. Uh, would you like to read the comment from Victoria? Because that's probably better. Oh, this yeah. is what distracted me when you were asking your other question about possibly finding more people who might be related to you. My family has been using Jewish family research website recently and all the Central European Jews we have ever heard of seem to be related to us and to each other. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, possible, I suppose. Um, but they, you know, they had huge families, right? You know, Jewish families at the time would have up to 12 children. And, and you know, if they all go different ways and then have another 10 children, that, that's what, I don't know, that's what happens. Um, I, I really enjoyed doing genealogy research. It's, it was definitely one of my favorite things to do. I'm gonna save this chat. And now uh, this is actually in the chat, but of course I'm sure lots of people are wondering that, is your book going to be translated into Russian? And if so, will it be that exact book or will you prepare a special Russian edition and what would be different? Um, it will be translated into Russian. I am just starting to work on that. We're actually working on the French translation first. It, um, it so happened that the, the French trans translation became a priority given how much family uh, there is in Geneva. Uh, and I think the community interest as well. Um, it, it is a good question. And I don't know if I have the answer to that because the book was definitely written for a Western audience. You know, there are certain things that I explain in the book that wouldn't need to be explained to anyone who's got any experience of living in the Soviet Union. Like, you know, the, the, the issue of trying to get a, a flat or an apartment, you know, quartierly by process, I call it. Um, so it's definitely a, something that needs to be addressed. And I once I once I start thinking about a translation, I will be thinking about those issues as well, because in a sense, it would make sense to adapt it a little bit. So, yes, yeah, so that that is uh, that remains to be answered. Uh, what, what happened, happened to, the to the branch of your family who went to Palestine? Yeah, so Genya went to Palestine and she had a very difficult time there during the Second World War because her uh, husband enlisted in the British Army and she was left on her own with Ariane, her daughter, who is here in the, in the audience, who, who was born while they were there. And so Genya had a really tra traumatic time. She was on her own in a, in a foreign country, in a foreign land, which was very different to what she had known. And she had very few, very little new from from Geneva and she was very worried about her sister in Brussels and um, so she left in 1945 as soon as the war was over she got on the first ship out and they came back to Geneva so the rest of what happened to to eventually she divorced her husband as well who stayed in um, who stayed in Palestine in Israel and, and they, they still live in Israel. So there were, there were cousins there as well. Um, but Genya herself returned to Geneva and uh, the rest of her life was spent in France and Switzerland. Um, what kind of feedback have you had from your family? Uh, because, you know, this is very cathartic, I'm sure for many of your family members seeing it all in one place, the stories of their lives. Um, yeah, tell us yeah, about the family yeah, reaction. It's been it's been amazing actually getting their reaction because I think and, and that's one of the reasons why I was also writing the book is that they didn't know what happened to us. You know, they didn't even know that we had survived. Uh, so Ayan had to ask her mother about us when when I first contacted her, and um, uh, there was I think part of the reason is that the two brothers Adolf and Marcus were so close that when contact broke off. Um, Adolf was maybe heartbroken, you know, there was so little that he could do for his brother, or there's so little he can, you know, he couldn't help him, he couldn't do anything. And so contact stopped. And they never looked and they couldn't have looked. I mean, there was no internet, they couldn't have found us. It was dangerous. It would have been dangerous for, for, for my side of the family. It wasn't possible. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why I also wrote this book, because it was a way of kind of telling everyone what happened and the daily life, as you said earlier you know, about ordinary people and how all the big kind of political events that we know and learned and heard of, how it affect, affected them. Um, and, you know, for the next generations as well, because as I always say, you know, this book, obviously it's a Russian, Jewish, European 
history and this 20th century and it's very important that we keep talking about what happened and we draw parallels between what's happening then and what's potentially happening now but you know the the, the bottom line is that these things and families being becoming separated and losing track of their loved ones it is still happening in the world today it's happening in other regions of the world you know it's, it's happening on the u.s mexican border it's happening in africa it's happening in the middle east so you know when i was writing this it was very important for me to to remember that that you know yes we have technology and yes we have skype and zoom and you can track all your ancestors but families are becoming separated and it's important to to keep talking about it as a, as a political issue as well i suppose I, when i was writing the the pages about um ava and anita when they were lost in northern france after belgium became occupied after the dunkirk chapter i, I read out you know, I was writing that in that summer when all the refugees were walking, escaping Syria and they were walking across Europe. And because I work for the BBC, you know, I would be at work and we had the feed. Um, Reuters had a camera on one of the borders with Hun Hun Hungarian border. And you can see people, it was a stream of people just walking and walking and walking for weeks. And I was writing those chapters of Ava and Anita at the same time. And, you know, for me, the parallel couldn't be starker. A slightly different question. I know you um, love getting this one. Now that you have written one book, do you plan on writing more? And what subject would you want to explore? I always feel like it's a trick question and I can see that it comes from Pushkin House. <laughs> Um, look, I'm going to concentrate on the translator, on the translations. I, I really want to get it out in French. I really want to do it in Russian and in Hebrew. I mean, who knows what else will follow? I mean, writing a book is no easy task and I enjoyed it thoroughly but it was also incredibly hard work so I think I do have ideas but they're kind of half cooked and not really there yet so if one day something really works out that would be amazing but I think I, I'm just going to concentrate on promoting this one for now and just making sure that it's uh, it can be available in other languages too. Well uh, as someone who saw um, books first sort of early days of life and had recently finished reading the final book that it became i can say it's an amazing labor of love and it clearly had many many years of very very hard work from the research that you can clearly see and beautifully summarized sort of very complex events condensed into sort of two or three paragraphs with everything that we need to know and also still keeping the personal lives so kind of present and so alive and actually that leads me uh, nicely into Helen's question a delicate question were there any relatives who were not pleased to be rediscovered in your book <laughs> no I don't think so I think I think uh, Afian is nodding <laughs> I think she agrees I think everyone was very happy uh to, to that we found each other no it's always very emotional when we come together you know and they're all in geneva it's only me and my sister who are in my grandmother who are like in london everyone else is always very emotional when we kind of manage to get together so no, everyone's really pleased and everyone was really pleased with the book um I, yeah so but i think what's also um very nice is you show people in their vulnerability a lot of the characters in the books so they're not heroes they're all sort of human beings who are tormented by making the right decision, by falling in love with the wrong person, by sort of, you know, keeping quiet about something or not. Um, and I think this is what's so attractive. You're not beautifying these people. You're just telling their stories absolutely as they are. And that makes it very identifiable, for, I think, for all of us. So whether you're Jewish or not, doesn't matter. Mm. Yeah, no, and I think that was definitely something that I was trying to do. You know, I, 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 obviously it's a family memoir, but, you know, I was writing it for other people to read and I knew that I had to be authentic and honest. You know, you can't just write and make someone look amazing and say all the right things because that's not what real life is. So obviously I was careful and I wanted to be, you know, delicate and not offend anyone. And I tried to make sure that everything was correct, but I also wanted to, to be real and authentic. So people outside of the family would also be able to identify it with it and to to feel like it's um it's the, re the reality of what happened and you know no one it's never black and white and and that's why it was also so interesting researching it and trying to like you know talking to all these people because 
you know, obviously we're close and we see each other, but I think when you interview someone and when you really try to get to the bottom of something happen, I think it's a very different relationship. And I, I really feel truly, truly, you know, humbled that everyone shared their stories with me and that I was allowed to, to read Ava's diaries. You know, when it all, I mean, now it's been 10 years that we've been one family, but you know, at the beginning when I was starting, we really didn't know each other very well. And when you come to someone and say, right, I'm going to read the most treasured possession you have the your diary the diaries of your mother your aunt you know it's it's a very kind of it's a it's a very um sensitive moment so I, I wanted to do justice to the story but also make sure that it was authentic for everyone to be able to relate to so you said that your grandmother does not speak english does this mean that she is unable to read this book which is in very large part uh, about her no, she, she, that's correct. She doesn't speak English. She is 90, almost 98. She'll be 98 next month. It's, um, she's just survived COVID. I mean, it, it's been a, an incredibly emotional experience. She's doing very well. I've got, um, just looking at the picture of her here. Um, it's very difficult for her. You know, she is, when, when I talk to her about the family and the fact that I've written this book and all the interviews that she, that we did, she, doesn't remember all the things that we discussed you know she doesn't remember everything that she told me so it was you know I have to be really sensitive around it because obviously she did tell me all these things and she knew that we were right that I was writing this book and she was very much on board and when I gave her when I gave her a copy of the book when it first came out she you know she, her eyesight is not very good at all and she had one look at the photo and she knew that it was her her father on the cover so you know there are, there are different glimpses of like she's very much aware of what's happening but she she does and um, it's not aware, aware of everything. So I think some of the conversations that we've had, she's definitely forgotten now. Mm. She's, like, she's well, always know, it, it, Yeah. Well, it sounds to me like we should stop talking and you should get translating so that she can actually <laughs> understand what is it that you said <laughs> no. but just i know that it's time i'm we're getting messages here from uh, the organizers i know it's time to wrap i just wanted to show obviously i didn't get a chance to show you all the photos all the amazing photos i have but i have a website which has all the photos so many more photos that are in the book and this is on your screens now it's nadiaragosina.com there is a whole gallery of pictures from both sides of the family and also all the links on where you can buy the book. I saw that um, Pushkin House had message saying that it's available from foils, but it's actually available from everywhere. Waterstones as well, Amazon, uh, from my publisher. You can also order it from your bookshops and bookshops love that. And I'm all for supporting small independent bookshops. You can ask them and they will order it from you because it's available, um, you know, in the mainstream out there. So. Uh, but the website has all the photos as well, so I do hope you can um, get a chance to have a look at them. And you can get in touch with me from the website as well. I do love hearing all the stories of everyone else who is either researching their family or have something that they want to share. There is a way to contact me through the website and I'm always very happy to hear. Well, Nadia, thank you so very much um, for writing the book, for doing this presentation. and. Thank you to everybody who was able to join and thank you for your wonderful questions. I've read the latest final version of the book in two evenings. I couldn't put it down. It is a great read and I do wholeheartedly recommend it. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for, for hosting and thank you to Pushkin House for, for hosting us here tonight. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>